kommt der Talk mit Peter Schaar zum Thema Bundesdatenschutz. And welcome to the English translation on Hall 1. Uh, the uh, talk today is uh, presented by Peter Schaar, the former uh, Data Protection Commissioner of Germany. Uh, and the talk is titled Data Protection Commissioners. Uh, actual guardian, an actual guardian or uh, simply a toothless tiger. I'm very happy to speak here today. I think that's about the biggest audience I've ever had. And I have the feeling that there is a certain interest. I would have been happy if during my active uh, work as a data protection commissioner, uh, the people I was trying to advise were actually interested. I did not always have the impression that they were, especially in the past half a year. The uh, link was uh, broken between uh, me and who I was advising. Uh, when what we're starting to learn about the uh, intelligence agencies, uh, we were able to better understand what they were doing. And people were responding, what an affair, and if there was one, it's over. And others were saying, um, all claims are off the table, but there is no mass surveillance of Germans in Germany. All of those were very interesting statements, and then something happened that was somehow related to mobile telephony. One particular mobile <laughs> phone was actually listened to, <laughs> so that, yeah, he's referring to Chancellor Merkel's phone, of course. So at least one statement was not true anymore. Namely that the people who are doing this are following German law. And when this was became public knowledge, one had to ask, were all the other statements true, even though we had them in written form? When I was invited here, uh, Constanze Kurz asked me if uh, I would be prepared to talk about the last 10 years of data protection. And I said, that's about as interesting as uh, feet falling asleep. And I'm going to instead speak about what data protection commissioners can or can't do. And I'm free to say that now because I'm a member of the uh, public again since September. So I can actually now talk about what, uh, what they actually do. But of course, I'm not going to uh, blame them too badly. So we're going to talk about uh, data protection commissioners. I'm not even sure how this image ended up in my presentation. I'm not sure I don't understand this. My understanding was not the stamps. This data protection commission is, we, we didn't want to just rubber stamp papers, but somehow that's the image of data protection commissioners that is very bureaucracy related. Uh, that's not what we want it to be. So I got another picture of a paper tiger. I like that much better because it's much nicer. On the other hand, it doesn't exactly represent my uh, self-image because a paper tiger does not have any teeth. And in, you really can't hurt anyone with this. So maybe this is not the right image either. Surveillance, controllers. So it's not this form of control that we like either. But at least that's something we deal with. And now we come to an image that I can really identify with. So you can see I've addressed appropriately as well to look a little more similar. 
too, too much. My wife told me when I showed her this, you can't see the claws either on this image. They're underwater. That's what I replied. Well, at least it's not made of pi uh, paper, which un after a little while would probably drown. So what are we as a data protection commissioners if we're not bureaucrats and not paper tigers? Are we really the controllers protecting everyone? Now let's step back a bit and why data protection to begin with? Uh, why do we need these institutions that deal with this subject? So I would like to go back a bit further. Um, you know the symbol on the upper left corner? I, as I assume it's the symbol of the United Nations. And the United Nations have in this year in 1948 uh, decided on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that no one, that private life is actually important, it should be protected. It says so in Article 12, it says that um, it is uh, protected from arbitrary interferences. So, for example, electronic, info electronic communication, IT in the sense we have today, uh, that we have it today, didn't really exist in those days. It was basically dreams. The first computers existed, but they were far from the processing core we have nowadays. So, then in 1966, um, they also, the UN also decided on the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Another legal basis, we as data protection commissioners, and actually everyone, everyone who deals with informational technology um, can actually use this as a legal basis. This International Covenant on pol Civil and Political Rights is somehow um, the Uni United Nations Pact on um, of, ci on s of Civil Rights. It has an interesting Article 17 that <coughs> kind of repeats what is also being said in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that nobody, so no one shall be subject to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his privacy, family, home or correspondence, nor to unlawful attacks on his honor and reputation. And uh, that everyone has the right to the protection of the law against such interference or attacks. So data protection is a human right. We, we, can't f we shouldn't forget this. If we wonder what are we talking about here, w it's not about some kind of bureaucratic norm that people f forced upon us, or that c some companies kind of, kind of, kind of, that's simply supposed to keep companies from making profit. No, it's actually a central right. It's a fundamental right that's inalienable, and that's valid internationally. And that's really interesting. Um, one or the other of you guys might have heard about this. Um, on the 8th of December, the General Assembly of the UN actually decided upon um, a new convention concerning surveillance. Um, it was proposed by the Brazilian and the German government. And in those times, the first draft was a bit sharper, but the final version, of course, was um, a bit more timid, but I kind of like this because it's good that we uh, remind people that the protection of data, the protection from surveillance, is not only guaranteed by, by national international law, by national law, but that it's actually something that should be regulated by international law as well. Because I mean, let's re uh, let's remember um, some attempts of justifying the NSA spying when the U.S. government actually was trying to show how their pra the practices of the NSA were actually lawful. Um, President Obama said in his first speech, in his first reaction to this whole thing, that nobody should, nobody should, be, um, should be scared in the United States because the people who were being watched were mainly, well, the foreigners, you know, those who are not always in the United States. And that already this statement wasn't wasn't right. That we know we know now, because 
um, there has also been a bulk collection of metadata and internet co internet content data, um, both of uh, in of Americans and foreigners. But what I, my my actual point is uh, here is that this declaration of uh, the American institutions that, well, at least we're adhering to our own laws, well, this cannot calm us down at all, because we aren't protected by this um, by these American laws. If we're uh, surfing the web, when we're using services online, whose servers are standing in the United States or wherever else in the world, and if these data are safe there, then American laws don't s protect us. Even if this data is being uh, stored in Germany, American law doesn't doesn't protect us. It doesn't protect us from surveillance. German law might, but if it does, well, you can discuss that. We can argue about that. But I think it's really important in this context that we kind of develop a universal understanding that fundamental human rights cannot be limited, restricted territorially, that you can't simply give that you can't simply give them to your own citizens, but it's that it's a fundamental human right. But that it's well a human right. A human right that's inalienable and universal and that it needs to be protected universally. Round of applause. In nineteen eighty one we have the the first binding directive concerning data protection on international level. It was the Convention of the Council of Europe, um, the Convention for the Protection of Individuals with regard to automatic processing of personal data. <laughs> this convention was decided on in January 1981. And for a couple of years, we now have an International Data Protection Day because of that on the 29th of January. And so internationally on this day, there are loads of activities. And if you would be interested in getting active in this area, well, do something on the tw 29th of January. It's the International Day of Data Protection, not only in Europe. Some more applause. In 1995, again, another step at the European Union. This time it was the European Union. At that time, they decided um, on a binding EU directive on data protection. This EU directive has to be implemented by the national by, by the national governments. And if I've counted correctly, we now have 29 member states of the European Union, and all of them have data protection laws. And all of them also have certain checkpoints that are well, according to this directive, um, that are supposed to be completely independent. Well, checkpoints, that sounds doesn't sound too unbureaucratic, but I'm not sure if pro data protection commissioner sounds any better. So we have in all of Europe, in all European states, these um, data protection agencies since the implementation of this directive. But, and that's something we have to deal with again and again, we have to ask the question if these uh, checkpoints are actually fulfilling their tasks in the way they're supposed to, especially in the context context of um, the Snowden leaks. We've it's became clear there's a certain restriction to this EU directive. This directive isn't valid for any institutions of police, uh, attorneys, or judge courts or intelligence agencies. That means that we do have um, a certain legal framework for this data protection, but this data framework is actually limited, well, in as, at least as, in so far as it is binding, to the area, to basically to the economy and to certain pub to certain state processing of data, but only um, in within the European Union. But at least. We do have data protection laws in the, all countries of the European Union, even if they're quite different. And I think we have more than twenty. So we have more than twenty-nine data protection agencies in all of Europe. We have a European Data Protection Commissioner, and we have there where we have federal systems like uh, the Federal Republic of Germany. We also have uh, commissioners on the federated state level, 
So we don't only have the central state level, but in Germany, for example, we also have, well, actually 17 uh, federated states data protection agencies. Why 17? Well, Bavaria has two, one for the public and one for the non-public data protection. This data protection directive is, sup is supposed to um, is supposed to uh, implement some way for these agencies to actually be e efficient. So basically, they're supposed to get the power to fulfill their tasks. So they should be able to actually implement mm, the prohibition of a certain uh, pr processing data process, or they should uh, should be able to. Um, block or delete certain data. Um, if this is actually being implemented in the way it was meant to be, we'll talk about that a bit later. In 2009, the, the law to data protection in the European Union actually became a basic right. It had been a basic right in Germany before, actually. Although if you look into the basic law, you won't find a single article that's called data protection. But the German Constitutional Court has j ruled in the 80s already in the so-called census judgment. Some people like me who might not be as young anymore might actually remember this. And in those days, the court actually say there's um, the right to informational self-determination. It's um, actually a basic right to informational self-determination. That is actually um, a consequence derived from the, hu from human di the right to human dignity and also the right to um, li right to free life and personal rights. And this basic law is actually applicable law in Germany and it can only be restricted um, for important reasons and only, as I might say, where it is proportionate, proportionate. And only in order to in and only in order to protect other basic rights that are basically on the same level. So it makes a huge d difference if a right is a basic right, a fundamental right, or if it's simply a normal right. So if we look at the role of these data protection agencies based on this background, we have to say, well, yeah, these data protection agencies and these data protection commissioners are there to actually protect the basic law. Well, at least that's what we're supposed to do. If we actually success in, uh, succeed in doing this, that depends on the context. And that's, that may also be linked to the fact that a lot of the p powers we might need are not implemented as we might want it. Um, data protection is a binding, Euro is binding European law. Um, adhering to the data protection directive uh, has to be ensured the adherence to these directives has to be ensured by independent checkpoints. And these checkpoints do need the, the sufficient powers to actually br bring through their agenda and to succeed in this, um, in this, with, in this task. And these are the teeth uh, of the tiger and the claws. So data protection oversight in Germany is a bit complicated. So uh, this is kind of simplified. But that's not a problem. I'm going to do this quickly. So the Federal Commissioner for Data Protection, what I used to be, he's responsible for um, the control of uh, the institutions of the federal state, but also for um, the co to for controlling uh, post and telecommunication companies. While the official appointees of the federated states and non-official federated appointees are are taking care of um, official institutions within the within the federated states and non-official companies. The these two these two agencies in Bavaria are somehow based on the history, but it's not really important in this context. What's much more important is the question: Are these agencies actually independent? And there's several decisions by the ECJ who are actually, the European Court of Justice, that are actually interesting in this context. Because data protection law is, uh, well, European law, the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, de dealt with the independence of these uh, agencies um, repeatedly, actually. One of the decisions, uh, one of the decisions was about Germany. It already happened in 2010. 
and the ECJ decided uh, about a, a, a suit against against the lack of independence of the Federated States Data Protection Agencies. So apparently there wasn't any, th apparently there was a legal oversight of these, so in the end the Federated State Government was actually a able to kind of push through their agenda. And there was an illegal, another illegal oversight um, within basically the everyday, light, uh, everyday life where basically the way these agencies could operate was being it was being decided upon by the ministries in these federated states. So the ECJ came to the conclusion that these directives that existed in Germany were not in were not in compliance with the European directive on data protection because there were these uh, relationships of dependence and there were, were these dependencies. What happened later? I'll <coughs> talk about that later on. But I just wanted to, to um, I just wanted to rem remind you of another judgment. Uh, later, uh, two years later, in 2012, they were talking about the independence of the Austrian data protection agencies, and there as well, they found out that these agencies were not independent, because apparently they were integrated into the um, Chancellor's Ministry, and there was also some everyday oversight and some actual over. Con content o con o oversight concerning the content of their work. That means this oversight, no, well, independence means that there cannot be any pressure on these agenc agencies, no organi organizatorial dependence of these agencies from ministries. These really are the main aspects of this question. So what happened afterwards? Um, in the Federated States, um, people, the governments changed the data protection laws, and the data federated states data, pr data protection agencies are now more or less independent. Um, the grievances the ECJ had were, well, changed. So, in that respect, on the federated states, on the state level, well, they followed the ECJ judgment. Now, you might think that it would be normal to actually implement this on this on the national level as well as it happened in Austria where the Austrian where the a Austrian data protection commission that is not they won't exist anymore from the 1st of January 2014 on but it's going to it's going to be replaced by a data protection commissioner that's actually going to be independent who's actually going to be independent so i also think that it's remarkable that here the step forward is coming from e Europe, and it's not coming from Germany. For example, in Austria, um, the, the German government actually helped the Austrian government in this court filing. So in that case, um, for the second judgment, Germany also lost, together with Austria. I wasn't sad about that. But what we have with the... Um, commissioner on the national level. Nothing has happened here. And that's actually surprising. Because we thought, well, we had the, because they said, oh, well, these ECJ judgments only concerned the Federated States agencies. So, well, if there was an ECJ, ECJ judgment concerning the national level, we would co implement these things. But as it was only about the Federated States agencies, well, it's not really a problem. And, well, but honestly, the basic laws are as valid on national level as on the federated state level. And what's interesting in this context is also that the status of the data protection commissioner is, is actu uh, actually continued. Well, uh, well, his status remained in a way that has been, that we already had before. Of course, we have this problem of his dependence and his position. Um, when I read the coalition agreement in September, I thought after after the elections in de December, I thought, well, there w should be something about this in, in the uh, in there. But they didn't say anything about the data protection commissioner. The same basically happened for data protection. They didn't really say anything except for the fact that they actually want to implement the da data retention directive. But what they were going to do about that afterwards and how they're going to change it. But after, no, well, they, they also said that after the implementation, they're simply going to change it. 
And I was like, well, it might be good to actually um, wait for the judgment of the ECJ for this data retention for this data retention directive because the general attorney or the general advisor of the ECJ actually said that this direct this di EU directive to um, data retention that was actually decided upon before the Lisbon treaties is not in accordance with the Treaty of Lisbon and is not in accordance with the basic law to data protection that's laid down in the <coughs> European Charter for for basic rights. Right now, it seems like people are per discussing about this in the political arena. But what I think is the most important thing is, do we really need this bulk data protection without any reason? This uh, retention of data about any p about everyone? I do not think so. What's also interesting is that. If you look at this whole discussion about the data retention, of the data retention, especially those people who are for it, they say, well, we have to implement it because it's coming from Europe. Because if we don't implement it, we might be forced to pay, any, to pay fines. Well, exactly the same people are the ones who say, well, but we don't have to implement the data protection directive. That's not really logical. Some are, there's a problem in there. And I would be really happy if people took basic, basic, basic rights seriously and if they actually implemented the data protection directive and if data protection agencies were strengthened without any, cha without any changes um, that would have to happen first in the in EU law. So let me come back to this um, story about teeth. Well, I, I still got my teeth, but that's a really personal statement. I'm not going to give you any details about this. But what can these data protection agencies actually do? Can they actually hurt anyone? Well, sometimes they can. The Federated States commissioners can actually make people pay fines of up to 300,000 euros. So you can say 300,000, that's not really that much if you compare it with uh, billions of uh, profit that are being made in certain areas, but it'll, it's something. And there have been incidences in some of these agencies where they actually acu accumulated these fines so that might actually start to hurt. One incidence I want to point out here is a Lidl, a German discounter. Um, you probably, you've probably all bought something there already. Well, maybe not all of you guys, but at least Lidl was um, a company that massively violated data protection guidelines. And this company then, well, in order not to have any, in order not to have in order not to have any representatives um, of uh, the of the workers, they um, basically had a structure where they had all these small Lidls. Um, so the data protection agencies uh, really used this in a nice way because they said, "Well, you have all these nice Lidls, so you don't have you don't need representatives for your workers in a central position. So, well, all of these small Lidls will also have to pay this fine." So you see, even official even official data protection commissioners have some creativity left. So, yes, unlawful data processing can be forbidden. I think this is actually this actually goes quite far. And uh, well, I we really are only talking about the people uh, the commissioners on the federated state level here. What can the f uh, national commissioner do? He can't make anyone pay any fines. And he can't prohibit unlawful processing of uh, data. But <laughs> but but he can, but he or she can ask the uh, can ask the federal can ask the federal network agency to do it. So he can basically simply ask this agency. But this isn't sufficient. We need actual sufficient guidelines to implement data protection in Germany. And these data protection agencies need sharper teeth. 
So the European Par Parliament Act is really, a uh, really interesting proposition in th for this area. Um, it was that was actually went well, actually went a bit further. There, they think that we would also need the possibility to find uh, to find violations to find violations of data protection with up to 100 million euros or up to 5% fi of a year's pro pro uh, of, of the 5% of the world year income. So I think that this is actually um, not quite nice and it would actually enable these agencies to impose fines finally. That of course this doesn't mean that somebody is gonna do this right away and impose a fine of hundred million dollar uh, euros. If they actually do that, it really hurts. But the idea is not to get this money for these ministers we have, but the idea is to make people realize that they can act differently. And I think this is important here. That data protection agencies shouldn't be lonely lonely charters in the desert but that they should also actually be able to show their teeth. Ladies and gentlemen, I come to my last point. How's the relationship between data protection agencies and civil society? I think that something needs to be clear, that these data protection agencies are not really part of civil society. They're official agencies, so they're actually o institutions of oversight. They're, it's people who control all the people. <coughs> but the task is to protect basic rights by controlling and by checking on official and unofficial institutions. So then, this the, the way they view themselves might be different from the CCC or other NGOs. But, of course, they might still have very similar views in certain areas and might actually work together. They do not write laws either. That's a, a misunderstanding sometimes. I still get some requests about this where people ask me why certain things don't work the way that people would like them to work. And I'm saying, well, I'm also unhappy about a few things. But as, a, like, as someone who's simply controlling people, like a conductor, I can only look at these things are already in the laws. I can't change them. You also have to listen. They, al they also have to listen to both sides. Whereas an NGO or a pressure group or lo lobby group for data protection can be quite one-sided why data protection agencies also have to view, always have to view the other side. And they also have to be able to look at um, competing interests and look at all of them. That's part of this construct. But at the same time, they also, they can also be able to implement transparency so far as they don't have non-disclosure agreements that are binding. And I, re I really recommend um, you to read some uh, data protection reports. Um, some of the Federated State, former Federated State Commission, it's some of those who are in uh, Canada, Australia, all over the EU. Um, you, it's, it's really interesting. You can get some interesting new knowledge from there. This is also good for the civil society um, to obtain certain facts and to obtain arguments that you won't be able to access in any other, in any other place. And these commissioners are also participating in the public debate, and I think that's right. That's that's right, and that's okay. Let me come to a close. Data protection, I think, is way too important to actually leave it up to official agencies and institutions. And I was already saying this when I was still the data protection commissioner, and I really think that this should be our aim and our main directive. And I also think there needs to be is this is more about cooperation than coexistence. Um, this coexistence of activities with within and outside the official sphere, sphere of data protection. So.
a lot of applause right now. <laughs> Standing ovations. <laughs> uh, I like standing ovations, yeah, but like... Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. I've never I've never had standing ovations before. Uh, apparently, I did something right. Uh, it appears so. Uh, we have a qu round of questions now. Microphones are down here. Uh, I'll call on you. Let's start with number one. Thank you very much. On uh, one of your slides, it said that one of the competencies of data protection agencies is to request the deletion of data. So when the Guardian was asked to delete data by the GHQ, uh, this was actually executed, but there were backups so that there was much of a point. So the question is, how can you actually ensure that data is actually deleted? Um, especially if companies save backups. Well, you th you say that data has have been deleted at the point where in the line in in the line of usage all backups ha have backups have actually been deleted and not only generally or theoretically been deleted but have be physically been deleted. So really, this threshold for deletion is quite high. You have. Well, the question how to actually implement this, there's a lot of discussion about this. For example, think about SAP that only recently um, enabled the actual lawful, an actual lawful deletion of data. And this question about deletion and <laughs> forgetting data, that's actually a problem because data can be copied as much as you want. So legally, there is this directive and you can uh, maybe actually implement this um, concerning official institutions, but if you can actually implement this with I inf intelligence agencies, is another question. So sometimes this direction of deletion is actually um, some kind of excuse for not being watched. Some of you may remember, especially well, at least the German participants, when the right-wing terrorism cell NSU was um, uncovered. And they have, there had been deletion days in several intelligence agencies, both on the federated state and the national level. And the reason for this was, oh, they they remembered that they were bound by data protection directives. I actually, I actually said something against this, against this because on the national level, I I had never managed, I had ma ma never managed to break bring my agenda through with the data pro with these um, data deletion directives. And then they said, well, they wanted to do me a favor later on. But what I'd say, well, it doesn't work like, that's not how it works. But I still think the deletion of data is still a topic, like an important topic, but it's harder and harder to implement it. Okay, a question from the internet. Uh, five questions from the internet. Uh, first off, thank you for 10, work, uh, ten years of hard work. Uh, Considering the use of your of the new data protection commissioner, do you? Th I'm not going to say anything about my successor here, or anything about her political views. If that's okay with her post, I'm not going to say anything. said in the beginning, you don't want to say that much about the last couple of years of your work. I don't think it's quite that boring as you made it to be. How can we imagine the practical work considering that the s federated state commissioners were the only ones to actually do anything? Were they... <laughs> Did did you make use of their teeth on occasion? Well, that's that's really hard because we're working in different areas and we're responsible for different areas. There's only 
very few areas where both federated states and federal state agencies are both responsible, uh, and that is there where um, former civil servants are still working in private companies. For example, um, the Deutsche Bahn, the German Railway, where there's still uh, civil servants within this one company for whom I would be responsible, why the Federated States Commissioner is responsible for um, the economic part of this company. No, sorry, um, it doesn't work like that. And that actually makes it more difficult. We actually had a few conflicts with the, f with the National Network Agency. When we w for example, when we were talking about the question, if w when we still had the data retention, do these uh, telecommunication companies do have to give this data these data to the people who were affected. I said, yes, I asked the European Commission, and they said, yes, this, this law means that this data that has to be given out also needs to be given, uh, these data also need to be given out to the people who are affected by this. And the German government didn't agree with this. So I was not able to make companies actually give out these data. And there were some legal discussions and legal fights, so that at least the telecom, the biggest German telecommunication company, actually gave out this da these data, and there was a huge problem, because other, I mean, otherwise it always means that you have to continue trying to persuade people, you have to go there again and again, and I really, the like going to the public really is something I have done a lot in those times. Questions: The data protection agencies are determined by their respective governments. How is this a problem if a government picks the commissioners? And won't they act in their interest? Is there sufficient uh, room for them to uh, make free decisions? Or how much do they uh, act in the interest of the governments, and how much in the are they bound to the law? Well, the first point, it's a dilemma, and I think it's not 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 a dilemma you can solve. <coughs> resolve that in the end, the political majority situation is finally something that's deciding, that's decisive for um, the da data protection commissioner. Of course, it's not only the government because it's the parliament that's voting, but of course the majority situation is being mirrored here. And I think, I don't see a way to come go away from this, and I, but I have no idea how to do this otherwise. Do you, do you want to throw dice? Do you want to find experts who, who, who decide to do choose these people? I'm skeptical here, but there's two aspects that are, th that are really important. And one of these is the time in office for these pr commissioners. I think the regulation of two times two times in office and the possibility of re-election is questionable. I actually would prefer regulation like we have it with the Constitutional Court, where you say that they're being elected for 12 years and they cannot be re-elected. And uh, I think for at least for this first time, because at least for this first time in office, of course there's this, always this danger that you might not be re-elected. That's one of these aspects. Um, the second aspect is that <coughs> it's also important to actually make these commissioners independent. They should not stay dependent on decisions by, for example, a certain ministry. They cannot be dependent on these things. It cannot even be a possibility. Independence really is essential in this context. All right, next question from the internet. Take a question from Twitter. Why were there no consequences from the uh, federal Trojan while you were in office? Well, I've um, given a report to the German parliament, and while well, it was kind of secret, but uh, somehow it was leaked into the internet, hmm. <laughs> I cannot say if, that was the, if this was the actual report. <laughs> Laughter. <laughs> but the members of the parliament were actually informed about this and the and which consequences you actually this actually is going to have for 
legislation and which consequences this is going to have for the actual practices, I can't decide on things like this. And also um, concerning legislation or my work towards official institutions, both the commissioner and the federated states, federated states agencies can only bring up the grievances or they can bring up a complaint, but this is simply formalized critique. Well, the ministry where somebody has complained, you sim they simply have to answer to this. And something that has recently happened to me and um, the interior ministry simply said, well, this complaint is not justified and nothing's going to happen. And this is also um, another discussion here where how, based on this EU data protection directive, these data protection agencies that maybe need more power in face of uh, p official institutions of the uh, official government institutions. Just a couple notes on uh, seating in the room, and we'll continue with another question from you, uh, Mr. Shire. You're, you're, you're done. <laughs> Uh, but you have a good reputation now. What are you going to use it for? What are you planning to do <laughs> next year? Well, um, that, that's that's a personal person question. But 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 don't no, but no. don't tell anyone, okay? No, no, we Please. Won't. No. Well, firstly, my plan is to write a book about the background of the Snowden affair and how we actually dealt with this, and also the technic how we dealt with this in a technical way. And afterwards, I'm just also saying this, I also took up um, a, uh, a post at the uh, European Academy for Data Protection voluntarily, this on a volunteer basis. And based on that, I'm giving talks, like for example this, but that's something I, li I like to do. Question from Microman, not two. Uh, on the Austrian data, Protection Agency, a small addition. The ECJ uh, decision uh, that the agency is illegal because it can't act freely, being under the uh, Chancellor's office. And Austria, there was a case that doctors and pharmacists sold data of patients. 350 cases, uh, and this particular case is no longer being investigated. And it seems that maybe this change is not actually going to make a difference here at all. Well, I can't really anything about this. Some, it's just something we should all recognize, even if it's sad. All right, Mike, number three. Do you know anything ab about a legal legal case against Sorry. well as far as I know uh, there there has been a complaint at the European there is a complaint at the European Commission concerning the position of the um, German data protection commissioner but as far as I know it's not pending at the ECJ yet it's possible that it's gone a bit further already but I assume if nothing changes there there is going to be actually a formal uh, court ruling. Uh, next question from the intern. Are the data protection agencies not mostly a placebo uh, that allows p uh, governments to say they have someone who deals with this, but they're entirely ignored when a governmental concerns are re like. Uh, well, first I'd okay. say, well, placebo or toothless tiger, that's not such a big difference. Well, of course, it's a huge problem that we say, well, at least there's someone who's taking care of it. And of course, there's some kind of like, it's it's kind of calming down people. But of course, you have this thing with all legal institutions, with all institutions, even the Constitutional Court. So I'd say that's, that's, that is not an argument against the institution itself, but it's an argument against the system where these agencies don't have the power to actually implement their agenda and to actually fulfill that task. That's why they need these powers. Next question, Mark 3. 
uh, with the IP storage uh, when uh, ISPs uh, offer flat rates, they said that doing this for seven days, that's uh, fine, and your agency agreed with that, even though the law says that they should not be doing that. Why was that accepted? And why didn't you make a statement that they're not allowed to do this? Which well, you say that's how that's what it says in the law. In, in the law, it says uh, delete delete it immediately. Well, immediately, that's a, a legal term you can interpret where you have to s where you have to define what it actually means. And we were in this situation where we had to kind of get an impression of the situation also by talking to the providers t for which aims they were actually saving these data. And they actually told us, and we believed them, they believably assured us that there were really high, that um, there were really high security measures. And so far as we understood this, it was in accordance with the ECJ judgment and the EU directive, so that the highest court has actually assured us later on that the position our agency took was actually in accordance with the legal situation. You might be unhappy about this, but the one of w one of those points where you can simply say, well, there's different points of view. You also have to listen to the other side. You can't simply do it like you want it to be. And we have to interpret the law, and that we might have to accept certain results that we don't like too much. But that also led to the fact that, in the end, the storage of I IP, address, IP addresses was really restricted for um, a lot of companies. Thank you. Mike, what? Mr. Shah, you didn't want to say anything about your successor, but please uh, help us a out a little bit. What would you, uh, what messages would you send uh, on her way? Uh, what should she be working on? Independently f from this person, I think it's, uh, seems, it seems it would seem obvious that the EU data protection reform is the main thing. There is this um, proposition by the European Commission that's quite ambitious. It's on the table right now, and the European Parliament finally, after really controversial controversial discussion, finally managed to come together with a quite a good result. But the council of the ministers of the different governments kind of came into a deadlock and sadly Germany is not really one of the powers that are actually pushing this data protection act forward and I believe um, a m clear position of the data protection agencies both on the federated and federal state level would be necessary in this respect. The second thing is actually data protection for workers where I see that if this data protection reform doesn't come, then people want will want to work on a data protection for workers. And I think, well, maybe this direction that's being proposed on the EU level, because even if there's going to be EU law, then we still need a German law f to protect to pr for data protection of workers. I do not understand why the German government is not tackling this problem. Because I really, really believe that Data protection of workers is an important, uh, of, and employees is an important thing. For example, if you work in the IT sector, is something that's happening with IT, and that's basically everyone, not ev these people that are in this hall, but all even people who are not really, really tech savvy. Even those people are really easy, e easily affected by uh, surveillance and especially secret surveillance. And I believe that these two things are really decisive for me. And of course, the third thing is the question of um, secret intelligence su agency surveillance, because we have to, how can it be that the NSA or even the German secret service are not bound by any laws in the international area? This can't go on like this. If we have a basic law, if we have a, a human right um, of data to data protection, this can't be. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> we'll keep an eye on this, I think. <laughs> Next question from the internet. I'd be interested if he thinks that data protection 
can be enforced better if I'm sorry I missed that part well that's a civil law aspect this whole these whole all these civil law solutions to data for data protection I'm a bit skeptical there in that part data protection would become part of the economic law and if there was an alliance of competitors that are actually working against data protection and that do not want to implement this then this is something that would not really restrict anything and nothing would really restrict it there and I really think we need clear national laws and clear national leg legislation there's also some kind of um, people who are some some people who are saying we need better compensation but if they're saying that we need this compensation instead of a data protection agency of over instead of oversight i think that's wrong because that means that we would have to that we would have to accept these violations of data protection laws until you get right until you have a judgment in court because that would also mean that <laughs> people who are not really savvy concerning um legal 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 regulations th those people are not are going to be the underdogs and those people are not going to be able to defend their rights. So I believe if we assume that pr the right to privacy is a human right, then we really need uh, strong and clear re legislation on the national level. couple notes on seed arrangements in our hall and another question. Uh, Mr. Shar, what would you think about making the position of the data, moving the position of the data protection well, commissioner I mean to the course, justice department? I would prefer if this wasn't implement, this wasn't integrated into any mystery, but if it was actually um, a German institution on the national level, like the constitutional court, that wouldn't have any anyone overseeing them uh, that would also not be dependent on the de per personal and budget decisions of any minister any other ministry which means that there can't be any autonomous decisions i think that would be the best way it might also be possible to integrate this in the, with the parliament that's that's the case in, on some in some federated states and i think the third best alternative would be to actually integrate into the, mi another ministry but yeah it's not really that great To get back to your project of writing a book, uh, is data protection commissioner, uh, aren't you under secrecy uh, regulations? Are you allowed to mention this regulation and who determines what you're allowed to say and how? It's true, I'm obliged to, well, s silence and I've got a non disclosure agreement I sign. But of course, I mean, there's this. Snowden history, uh, this whole Snowden thing. So there's a lot of information that's openly accessible. So as as long as I re as I refer to open data and then the information that's publicly available, it's okay. Of course, I can't talk about or I can't report about things um, that I worked with uh, directly. For example, in the Constitutional Court. And of course, I'm going to adhere to that. But everything that's being discussed open in, in, in public, um, I'm going to discuss in public by myself and in my book. Another question on the internet? What do you think about the next steps in data protection in Europe? And especially the time component well, this is about the data re retention law. And I would just like to remind you, we have a decision by the German Constitutional Court. It's been a few years ago. I think it was 2010. The Constitutional Court decided that the data retention directive is not compatible with the German Constitution. And since then, we don't have any data retention in Germany anymore. What we do have, well, we have on the European level um, a filing in court that's still pending right now. But the general attorney, the general advisor of the ECJ, uh, filed a report two weeks ago. And this report said that the da data retention contradicts the Treaty of Lisbon and the fundamental rights of people in the Euro European Union. And based on this, 
this directive this directive will have to be changed if the ECJ follows this advisory opinion of the general attorney. So the next question is going to be how is the ECJ going to decide? And also the time frame, it's not really clear, but I assume that this will possibly already happen in 2014, possibly even within the next month. And that at that point the ECJ is finally co going to come to a result. And it's basically dependent on this decision which way this directive is going to go. And I believe you can kind of derive fr from this what's also what's going to happen to the German data retention law. What's in the coalition agreement? Well, I already commented on that. I don't think it's reasonable and a good idea to take a directive that's apparently obviously contra contradictory to European law and to take this uh, dir to directive and actually implement it. I think it's a really bad idea and it doesn't make any sense. A little bit of time left. Mike Boyer. Mr. Schauer. Uh, and one question I do have. Independent of the action of the person who is the data protection commissioner, what would be the result of the commissioner not having an interest in enforcing data protection? I'm not going to comment on this question. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this like a politician. Well, um, so, me, I'm, everything I've told you, the thing that I like the fact that, that we have data protection agencies, there's countries like the states where we don't have comparable structures but I see that there's a really strong civil society that has actually taken up the data protection topic. And I really actually have the feeling that this movement is stronger in these countries than in Germany in some points. And I believe that these parts of civil society that are working for data protection do have a really high personal, like really high meaning. They're really important. Never mind who is the data protection commissioner. So I also would say, well, it's your turn now or it's their turn. My question is, and Hoffer is the task of the Data Protection Commissioner uh, and the task of the intelligence agency coordinators uh, overlapping, and how far should they reach into each other's area? Well, theoretically, they don't really overlap. Uh, actually, there are gaps. So there's the situation where there's neither a parliamentary commission nor the data protection commissioners of the federated or the federal states that can actually look into certain situations, tr certain things. I think it's really irresponsible and this has to be changed. And these different uh, commissions, uh, con controlling commissions, need to be connected much better. What's interesting is that our interior minister, Friedrich of those days, earlier this year said that he was against the data protection commissioner becoming some kind of over oversight. I, d I don't say that and I'm not saying that now either. What I think is that it's important for these agencies to be able to go to these places and um, to be independent. The problem of parliamentary control apart from secrecy matters is that parliamentary commissions always mirror the majority situation we have in Parliament and that means that any independence for agencies would be go a good thing. So that's why I think that the idea of having this is idea of be it via data protection agencies or via commission protection or vo via oversight for intelligence agencies um, to actually strengthen these uh, protection data protection commis commissioners. I think it's a good idea. Uh, next question on the internet. I'll join two questions that I've seen here. Could you have given your talk today when, when you were still in office? And what is the relationship between data protection agencies and security agencies? 
Well, had I been able to hold this talk, I would say yes. Maybe I would have used a different phrasing in some cases, but more or less, yes. And I, I mean, some of you may know, I mean, I've done this. Um, I'm, it's not, it's not that different. The second thing, well, yes, this data protection control in the security area is really, really important and needs to be strengthened. And there need to be possibilities. We need human rights and international law standards that actually go beyond the national territory and the data protection agencies need to become active here. If we want an international law regulation of this area, that's a really hard way, like it's something really, really difficult to, uh, to achieve. But there we will need something that we have in other areas as well. We do have on the international level uh, commissioners for chemical weapons. We have commissioners that are seeing that they're, uh, they are taking care that um, Nucle nuclear power material is not uh, being given to people who are not supposed to receive it. And I think we need such commissioners for data protection on the international level as well. Another question from Mike 3. You mentioned that uh, there is a possibility for uh, the state uh, data protection commissioners uh, to disallow uh, processing of data. Where is the difference between data processing being disallowed by the law and the agency telling them not to process the data? Well, the one thing is the general universal directive and the other one is a targeted decision where under the threat of certain fines, you can say someone, well, now you have to stop this state process of data processing, that's a huge difference. W the one is the, impl the former is um, the legal directive itself, the latter is the actual implementation of this directive. So this legal directive is basically the legal framework, it's the basis of this action and um, this threat of a fine is the actual implementation. And well, the fine would be, well, a fine. You mentioned that uh, the employee data protection uh, law. Uh, what about data protection uh, for unemployed people? How is it possible that we are in a situation where we can, where we have to give all our data, very private data, otherwise uh, we'll be without a home next week? Uh, how is data? protection ignored in this area? Well, this is a topic I've been thinking about a lot already. When this um, reform of the German, uh, of the German uh, unemployed support law was changed, um, I worked towards a change of the system, but I basically did not get any support from people in politics, from any politicians. This whole thing was about the, the thing that people who are receiving these unemployment benefits really need to announce any other sources of income. That's the principle based on which this uh, unemployment benefit, these unemployment benefits are being granted. This went really far and my question to, uh, my, my, my attempt to actually bring this up in the pu public agenda basically <coughs> failed. I think it was really interesting which data protection topics are being perceived uh, publicly and receive a lot of support and which don't. So for example, the process, for example, for, uh, this thing about the CD with the data of a lot of people who had, well, of a lot of tax evaders, where I also had a lot of, where I also had a lot of, um, well, I was skeptical about this. There was a lot of support for these things, but talking about unemployment benefits, the support really was uh, minimal and basically non-existent. So there, we do have laws, even if I don't really like this that actually go really far and that actually and actually make the receivers of certain of certain state benefits to transparent citizens and i think that's a political question that needs to be discussed politically 
as a, even as a data protection commissioner, you, at some point you don't really have any possibilities to change something anymore if neither the legislation, le the legislative nor the public actually re recognize this as a problem. We still have the situation that, in principle, we have a strong data protection law in Europe. But, for example, as you mentioned earlier, in the U.S. this is not the case, but there's a much more massive civil uh, movement against or for data protection. And there's still the question of uh, transatlantic treaties where data from Europe flows directly to the U.S. or you, the U.S. can directly access information in Europe. Uh, how can we still fight these uh, treaties or how can we prevent them from receiving this data? Uh, are these treaties uh, even valid uh, considering our data protection laws? And what is going to happen there if we're going to harmonize data protection within Europe? Well, I think this is a huge topic. I'm, well, I'm going to try to mention two or three parts of this. The first thing is the daily da transfer of data into the US. The whole safe harbor agreement is really important in this respect. Safe harbor means that companies in the, in the within the states say that they're going to adhere to certain data re protection principles, but these da principles are much, much lower than the your level of the European law. But um, the European Court, the ECJ, actually accepted this as an acceptable level of data protection so that this transfer of data in this area can actually happen in this way. But, and that's what I think is really important, um, thanks to these uh, leaks over the past month, it's become clear that intelligence agencies also gain access to certain servers based on this agreement actually, and which uh, and these data are actually data that are actually being transferred to the states based on the safe harbor agreement. And in that respect, I, I think personally that this decision sh could not be, should not be applicable anymore and that this uh, whole agreement has to be revised. Unluckily, the European Commission as a whole has not really un uh, commented on this so far, but I still, but I already see a lot of support for a decision here. Secondly, there's several agreements uh, that have been made between Europe and the states, sometimes with um, European states, sometimes with the EU as a whole. In these several agreements, there's a lot of information that is being sent to the Americans. For example, fingerprint data, DNA, and Germany was also actually one of the first countries to sign such a bilateral agreement. I actually criticized this sharply in those days, but without any success. Well, it was underground coalition again. Well, you would have to cancel these things if you want to. Thirdly, well, there's these agreements between the European Union and uh, the United States about data of flight passengers and there's the SWIFT agreement. And these agreements where, where information on financial transactions are going to the states. And here the European Parliament actually demanded this directive to be put, taken out, of, like t to be canceled. But it's also something that might go up to the ECJ in the end. The way it is right now, it I think it really can't stay like this if you remain true to your principles. Just a quick question about the second point. Is there a possibility of the Constitutional Court to actually dem talk about this? Well, you would have to talk about this if that is possible because this is actually um, an agreement that's legally binding based on international law. Um, it took us a while. It was because of the Senate in Hamburg. Well, uh, the Green Party was in Hamburg, and they actually prevented <laughs> they prevented the ratification of this agreement. 
because this would have to be uh, this would have to be agreed on by all members of the Bundesrat, the lower the, uh, the upper chamber of the German system, where you have the representatives of the federated states. Um, so far, I don't think you can. I don't think no. If you can do anything against this bilateral agreement Next on the national level. Next question from the internet, uh, Mr. Shire, can you name a country where you th where you think the work of the data protection agency or the implementation of a data protection agency is better than in Germany, or do you have a, a um, idol? Well, it's always hard this this idol thing. If well, maybe. You m you might do it. For example, Spain has uh, stronger me measures of implement means of implementation, and I could Im like I mean I could imagine that we can't could might be able to profit from this Spanish system. We also have in other states sometimes uh, data protection agencies that are much better equipped, and here we might actually well copy some aspects, but I don't know any agency where I say, well, this one is perfect, you really have to see that Europe is already on quite a high level here. And that's why I also think that this uh, reform of e EU data protection law is so important. two days, so in 2014, uh, the new European Data Protection Directive becomes effective. In Austria, no, not on the European level. No, uh, sadly not. not. Would be nice, would be nice. I wouldn't stand here. The gravitation I assumed. If there weren't always uh, more totalitarian elements in our uh, government, because the separations of powers between legislative, executive, and judicative do not exist anymore. And it's important to have a public discourse here, but the way we are trying to, we are attempting this is wrong, and the problem is. The way I mean, the the way we're actually trying to do this is completely wrong. Uh, also, the way universities and science tries to do this, I would is for example, universities. There's this triangle of in industry, politics, and science that it hasn't led to any results in universities. I really finally want a so social discourse discourse about data protection. That's that's like a statement. We, we we leave it like that, I assume. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shar. You've made my job rather easy. A big applause for Mr. Shar.